so hi, everybody. Uh, I am Lisa Rosenberg. I'm the executive director of Open the Government. Uh, thank you for um, to the panelists and to the audience, uh, for lack of a better word, for joining this um, Sunshine Week State Open Government State of the Union. Um, you know, especially given everything else that's going on, we really appreciate your attention and your time to these matters. Um, I want to quickly introduce our experts who are all, uh, their lovely faces are all on your computer screens right now, um, and then go over the format for today. Uh, so our experts are Liz Hempowitz. Liz, wave. Uh, she is with Project on Government Oversight. We have Alex Howard with the Demand Progress Education Fund. Irvin McCullough who, with, uh, the, with the Government Accountability Project. Ryan Mulvey with Americans for Prosperity Foundation. Uh, and Melissa Wasser with Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. Um, and all our experts on a range of openness and accountability issues. Uh, so whatever questions anybody has, you know, please don't be shy. Somebody's gonna know the answer here. Um, but rather than treat this like uh, a traditional panel, opening statements, um, that sort of thing, I thought it might be a little bit more interesting and more fun to make it more of a conversation. So I want everybody who is, um, listening in, watching in, what's the right word? I, it, it's not audience, but in any case, for everybody who's online, to definitely feel free to you know, jump in and ask questions or, um, or text if you have questions, or, uh, use the chat if you have questions that you want me to ask, whatever. Um, but let's kind of keep it informal. I've already encouraged the panelists to ask questions of each other, talk to each other. Um, you know, we have an hour and uh, we can really cover a lot of what's going on in openness and accountability and we should just keep it as, you know, interesting and relevant to everybody who is um, online uh, as we can. Now, having said all that, um, I am going to uh, take advantage of my moderator's uh, spot and launch the conversation, start the conversation. Um, and it seems like an obvious place to start is with the coronavirus. Um, and there's a couple of accountability issues that I know I'm concerned about and we at Open the Government are concerned about that I kind of want to get some feedback and some input on. Um, you know, the first was that the White House announced, gosh, was it just last week, um, that uh, Vice President Pence would be coordinating the messaging effort around coronavirus um, around the pandemic, it seemed that, uh, you know, experts, scientists, health um, officials in the government would, would have to basically clear their messages through the vice president, through the White House. Um, and that certainly struck most of us here probably as potentially chilling of free speech. Um, there was concern that it would be limiting the accuracy and timeliness of the information that did get out and this information that we think we can all use. Um, I think another, you know, the, the White House's argument would probably be that they needed to coordinate the message, they wanted to speak with one voice, we needed to also not instill panic or fear. Um, so I'd love to have a little conversation about what everybody thinks about that part of the coronavirus effort. Um, and then the other part that I think is even more concerning is the Reuters report just yesterday um, that the White House is classifying a number of meetings around coronavirus and as near as anyone can tell, and again, I would love to get everybody's feedback on this. There's no legal justification for that at all. Um, and probably no, yeah, you know, even policy uh, justification for that other than, well, uh, probably no policy justification for that at all. We'll just leave it at that. Um, and so uh, I'd love to get anybody's thoughts, you know, has that ever happened before? Is this unprecedented? It certainly seems unprecedented to me and it seems like a dangerous, um, a dangerous president to begin to, to start. Um, now for our part, I will say one thing that Open the Government is doing is that along with the Government Accountability Project, we filed FOIAs uh, just uh, yesterday, the day before, to try to access some information about the response to the virus. Um, we reached, we submitted FOIAs to CDC and NIH, um, again, about this um, directive to message everything through the, through the vice president's office. Um, and we wanna get some other information about you know, the meetings and, and documents and who's talking to who. Um, 
I don't expect we're going to get a lot of fast responses to those FOIAs, but we are prepared to um, to do what we can to expedite the responses, go to court if necessary. So we'll certainly keep everyone posted as those uh, those efforts evolve. Um, but with that, let's let's talk coronavirus. Um, maybe Irvin, I'll just point at you first since uh, you know since since Gap was part of who helped us out with these uh, with these FOIA requests. But obviously, anybody else should feel free to chime in at any time. Absolutely. So I'll go through exactly why we see this directive as so chilling. And to refresh a bit, all of the science experts and all the science agencies working on the coronavirus outbreak response are being told by the vice president's office they have to coordinate all of their messaging with the VPOTUS office as opposed to just going out and making their own statements. And like you said, that usually could be a good idea. Uh, the speaking with one voice during a national crisis can very much be a good idea. But what we don't know is whether or not whistleblower rights are being constrained or whether or not employees and scientists working for the government might perceive their whistleblowing rights to be constrained. For the past two decades or so, every year inside the Consolidated Appropriations Act and also inside the Whistleblower Protection Enhancement Act of 2012, there's a provision that says you have to include this paragraph in any management communication that's gagging employees, federal employees, or restricting their rights to free, free speech or free expression. And that paragraph essentially says that everything else in this management communication is null and void and unenforceable. Uh, it does not go past your whistleblowing rights, that no matter what communication that we give to you that restricts your, your ability to communicate openly, you still have whistleblowing rights. And what that means for a lot of CDC or HHS employees is that regardless of centralizing a message with the vice president's office, if they see a substantial risk to public safety, they can still make any claim that they want to uh, that supports that claim. Uh, and what we don't know is whether or not the vice president's directive actually had that paragraph in there, reminding employees that they are duty bound or at least free to speak out when they see something that's going on that's wrong with the coronavirus response. Liz, I'm going to interrupt you and ask you to speak up a little bit. Yeah, sure. I very rarely hear that. Um, but, but just the, the, that statement that Irvin was talking about earlier that's legally required to be in all these communications guidance documents, at the beginning of the Trump presidency, they weren't included. And so he's totally right that they might be inside these, gui in these guidance documents. But the fact that we haven't seen them means that we just don't know. And I think Dave uh, is asking for a bridge too far from the White House to ask us to trust them. Anybody else have any thoughts or responses to the uh, the directive of about communications? Melissa, what about from sort of a reporter's perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, the biggest thing here is that when the Reuters article came out, we immediately had eyes on it because it's going to hurt the press's ability to report information to the public. I think something that's going on right now with how the government has responded, how they've had to coordinate their efforts of communication through the vice president's office is that people are getting conflicting information. They're not getting enough information. People are scared. They don't know where to turn. So it's up for, um, it's the responsibility of the press to make sure that they're reporting accurate information so the public is prepared and ready, uh, you know, should coronavirus or, you know, this affect them at home. So if they're classifying things or treating, you know, these meetings as classified, um, it's really going to hurt journalists' opportunity to report accurately and fairly on this. I mean, a tip that we're seeing is that even though what's happening at the federal level is, you know, very concerning, journalists might be able to use FOIA um, resources at the state and local levels to see 
you know, what their localities and their states are really doing. Um, you know, even right now, we're seeing that there's uh, drive-by or drive-in testing in Denver. You know, in Colorado, it might be easier to submit a FOIA request to see what communications were there to go to that decision. Um, in Ohio, my home state, you know, they've canceled all of these in-person sporting events, you know, NCAA first four tournaments. You know, you might be able to use state FOIA resources to kind of get more information and more accurately report this out to the public. So, you know, we're hoping that reporters are still, you know, taking precautions themselves. I would also like to point out that um, CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, also recently released um, uh, resources on how journalists can cover the outbreak. Um, so those are also helpful as well. But there are state and local resources that they can use in addition to federal ones. And what about, thank you, I think those are great tips. Um, and it's certainly something that many of us who've done FOIAs um, have always you know, realized is that if you can't get the information from the feds, you know, you tried another, I try another avenue. And a lot of times, whatever the topic is, you might be, uh, might be better off going through the state or local resources. Um, I want to dig in a little bit more too about the whole classification piece, though, in addition to not getting information out, um, you know, there's a concern that the right people, the knowledgeable people aren't in the rooms, the decisions are being made because they don't have the proper security clearance. Um, I think that that could be, you know, really detrimental for um, the health and safety of the people in this country. Um, but also, you know, if this, if this information is classified, how hard is it going to be to ever find out, you know, even once this crisis is over, you know, what was happened, what decisions were, were made? And I don't know if anybody has any thoughts, Alex, I bet you do have <laughs> thoughts on that. Well, sure. I, I mean... <laughs> This is the opposite of what we should be expecting from our federal government in a public health crisis. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of things happen at the same time right now that um, make this much worse than it should be, right? Uh, and I wish that that weren't the case. I wish that we didn't have a president who's the greatest source of disinformation in our public life, right? I wish that we had a White House that had been holding press briefings. I wish we didn't have um, systematic delegitimization of the media that we are now trusting to get this right, as Melissa just described. I mean, it is so important that our national leaders, our civil servants, our scientists um, are able to get trustworthy information to people in the places that they are um, and cease attacking um, the journalists who are doing their best to get that information um, and also leverage the tremendous resources that have been built up now for many years um, to provide information directly to the public online in actionable ways. And um, unfortunately, the information environment, as everyone knows, has been incredibly polluted by misinformation and disinformation and rumors are running rife. Um, social media and smartphones have changed the context. We're living in this right now by zooming in together and talking uh, where there's a back channel. It is critical that the government does not keep secret that which the public needs to know because they're concerned. Every time there's a gap between what they know and what they tell us, it decreases trust even more. And it doesn't take a lengthy recitation of all the times in our country's history where that's been true. Whether it's Vietnam, right, or that's what happened in the Iraq war, um, any time that the top level of government knows something that has an impact upon public health or public safety and mislead the public or conceal it from the public, then it gives even more gas, I think, to the rumors and misinformation. And given that this is a Sunshine Week open government discussion, um, it's never been more important to encourage every politician to emphasize the importance of trustworthy information and that journalists do not invent sources and they're not out to get people. They are part of our communities and they have families too and they are trying to just do the best they can to hold power to account and to use those tools. Well said, absolutely. Ryan, did you wanna chime in there? Yeah, I mean, I think I have two thoughts. I would agree with a lot of what Alex um, just said. I mean, regardless of whether there are adequate legal or policy grounds to, at least within the FOIA space, to, to classify and withhold information. The danger is always avoiding 
overclassification um, and unnecessary withholding, particularly with, when you're dealing with with a, a topic of, of pressing national uh, concern, where there's not only a lot of press interest, but ordinary citizens are, are looking to the federal government um, for information about what's happening and, and what they need to do. Um, I think s stepping back to maybe the first topic that we got to um, and the sort of coordinated and centralized effort um, to control information going out to the public, that doesn't surprise me. Um, certainly the current crisis of coronavirus is something that we haven't seen um, uh, if ever in the in the history of the FOIA. I mean, this is a, a rather unique situation. Um, but previously, uh, the white other administrations, Republic, including this administration, but Democratic administrations as well, have used sort of uh, centralized, sensitive review processes um, when different agencies are getting requests on the same topic. Um, uh, and often that has been routed through Office of White House Counsel. I've seen records suggesting that in previous instances it's gone through uh, Office of the Vice President when the Vice President sort of acts in a uh, special capacity uh, as, as Vice President Pence is doing. And I, I think for all the benefit that that could bring, on paper at least, uh, the danger is in slowing, at the, at, at, in a most charitable sense, the danger is slowing down the release of information. But what also ends up happening is a politicization of, of FOIA and of disclosure. And for whatever reason, whether it's to avoid embarrassment, a, a political fallout, or because of maybe a bureaucrat thinks it's for the public benefit to keep something secret, which, as Alex has suggested, is often the opposite uh, and ends up having the opposite effect, you see a lot of information tied up and just never released or improperly redacted um, because of those sensitive review processes. So it's not it's not unprecedented in a sense, and uh, it doesn't surprise me. But it is something that we should be concerned about and vigilant and and hold the government uh, their their feet to the fire on this. Yeah. Can I jump in and tie a few of these things together? So, you know, I think what you were saying earlier, Alex, is totally right, that we're in an, we have to, the context really matters here. And the White House has been um, really instrumental in kind of contributing to the problem we're having right now, where we're not quite sure what information we can trust coming from what sources. And so I want to go back to what Irvin was saying earlier, too, is that that's why it's so important that we can hear from career civil servants right now that are experts in these, in these spaces and in these in these issues because I think even given the damage to the civil service and the morale there there are still a lot of people inside government that that know what they're doing that are not political actors and that can speak with the voice of authority right now um, that 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 frankly is just lacking from some of the institutions that should have that authority or should be able to speak with that authoritative voice. But even that politicization process has affected FOIA. And we've seen agencies this year moving towards an increased role of political appointees in the FOIA review process and a decreased role of civil servants in reviewing those, in reviewing those records and in determining what is responsive to the request and what isn't. And so I think, you know, this problem isn't limited to this White House, isn't limited to this administration. Administration, but but given the situation that we find ourselves in right now, the coronavirus and the and the severe um, you know threat it poses to public health, I think it we've reached a catalyst where where all these issues are coming together and we're starting to see the importance of everything that's happened over the last few years. I want to jump in too quickly to respond to something Ryan said. So this hasn't happened before in the same way. I was around in 2009 when H1N1 hit. And I watched what happened with Ebola in 2014. And there is a marked contrast between how this administration and the last one approached messaging to the public, how they elevated experts, how they coordinated pandemic response in the White House National Security Council, which we know was diminished in 2018 because the president decided it wasn't important. Like there, there is a contrast. Um, and the contrast couldn't be clearer around the elevation of government um, scientists and government expertise, um, as opposed to the consistent denigration of that expertise and undermining of their authority, um, even contradiction. Um, and to Liz's point, we saw again, Dr. Fauci in front of Congress, who is 
clear, who is doing exactly what we hope someone in this position would do and acknowledging, for instance, that there is a failure of testing, right? We have the president going on camera to address the nation last night, claiming the testing is fine. And it's clearly not, right? This is something that the world can see that we are way behind where we should be. We have Congress performing its role, having public hearings where the public can see, can go on C-SPAN and watch the hearings. Um, and this technique of trying to gaslight us all into believing we can't, we're not seeing what we're seeing isn't gonna work on this. Um, and it couldn't be more important for, um, I think, this community to be rallying around exactly what Liz is saying, right? To elevate the scientists and ensure that the whistleblowers, um, which I hope Irvin will come back to, um, are up, upheld, right? That their immune system for making sure that um, there isn't fraud, waste, abuse, incompetence, corruption being hidden. Well, now they're really important for making sure that government response is going well too. I totally agree with that. Uh, and and I, I will get back to the whistleblowers in just a minute. Before that, and I, I agree with all the points that the folks on the panel just raised. Uh, I want to go back to the overclassification issue really quick, uh, just to say that back to Liz's point earlier, this is where any administration has to draw upon a reservoir of trust that they've created through years of actually being open and honest. And the Trump administration just does not have that. As Reuters reported, administrative officials administration officials said that they weren't being given access to certain meetings or certain documents or certain records because those records or meetings are classified or are happening inside a SCIF. Uh, now, I can play devil's advocate for that. I can see why some every once in a while meetings on the coronavirus might have to happen in a SCIF. My first thought when I read the Reuters article was of uh, a piece by a journalist named Jenna McLaughlin in Yahoo News at the end of February where she reported that most of the intelligence that we had or data that we had available on the China outbreak was collected by the Central Intelligence Agency. And that means that when you have a fair amount of data that's being collected by the intelligence agencies, it probably will be classified and there might be a valid reason for that to happen. But in this case, the Trump administration does not have a reservoir of trust to draw upon and say, hey, listen, some of this is validly classified. Some of it is justifiably classified when we're on the outside looking in on the verge of a pandemic, in the midst of a pandemic, that's not good enough. Uh, they actually have to explain exactly why this is happening. And to my recollection, I don't even think they've responded to the Reuters piece yet. I could be wrong there, but I haven't seen any public response justifying the classification or saying that these meetings are all being hosted in unclassified settings. And on the whistleblower point, I really am afraid that this will discourage whistleblowers from coming forward. There are different systems when classified information is involved for reporting that information either through the, administra to, through the administration internally or to Congress externally. Uh, one victory that our community secured recently was the ability for non-intelligence community employees to make reports of classified information. So make whistleblowing disclosures involving classified information, not just to the congressional intelligence committees, but to any committee of relevant jurisdiction. And that's really important. It's something that we would not have expected to be utilized in this instance when I thought of it, uh, when, when uh, a lot of us were thinking of it and toying around with the language. What we were thinking and had in mind was State Department employees wanting to go to the House Foreign Affairs Committee. But I could very realistically see uh, a situation in which HHS or CDC employees want to go to the House Energy and Commerce Committee uh, with classified information for oversight and investigations into whatever wrongdoing they may see. Uh, but at the same time, you have the administration actively trying to chill these whistleblowers, uh, rejecting the science. And that's dangerous to everyone because it means not only do they not really have a response put together, but whistleblowers who would be the eyes and the ears on the ground implementing this response, overseeing its implementation, making sure that no problems are there, they're chilled. They might not come forward just when we need them to come forward the most. And I think one of the go ahead, Liz. Well, I think uh, you know, Ergen mentioned um, that really great provision allowing whistleblowers with um, with classified information from outside the intelligence agencies to be able to go to the committees of jurisdiction. Um, but I think contextually, again, it's important to think about the moment that we're in right now, especially on the heels of an impeachment effort. Everything Congress does is seen as political, and I think this is another 
place where it's really important for us to take um, partisan politics out of this and look at this as the health crisis that it is. And so if there are whistleblowers going to Congress to blow the whistle on what they're seeing in terms of the government's response to coronavirus, they should not be politicized the same way that we've seen previous whistleblowers politicized. And it's really important, you know, I was seeing Republican senators earlier today kind of speaking out and saying, you know, we should be correcting the message. We should be making sure that we're getting the right information out there um, and that, you know, correcting what the president has said, that, that people aren't able to get tests if they want to, and the importance of making sure that, that accurate information is out there. And I think we need to make sure that we can make that as easy as possible, especially for members of Congress, that this isn't a political statement to be telling the truth right now. You know, there's a, there's a real reason, um, and it's, you know, lives are at stake here. I mean, I think you're right. I don't know if I'm optimistic that um, a whistleblower coming forward with any information right now would not be politicized. Um, but, uh, you know, I agree that this community has to encourage that at least and support whistleblowers and support those few members of Congress and hopefully increase the numbers of members of Congress, um, you know, who are willing to support the truth. I mean, it's it's amazing to me. And, and on Sunshine Week, you know, Sunshine Week is, is supposed to be a um, a celebration of openness, transparency, accountability, and um, the, the partisanship that has, you know, kind of infused the issues of transparency and open government um, is, is remarkable to me. I mean, it's really, th these are such sort of basic issues, um, you know, motherhood and apple pie, but they have all become very politicized. And I just, it, it's, it's something that I think going forward, um, you know, we're going to have to try to address. We're, it's going to, again, be up to this community to say, look, these are not partisan issues. These are not political issues. These are foundational issues that are important to our democracy. And I, I, I wanted, if we have time later, to get into that a little bit more sort of forward looking. Um, but I do, we did have uh, somebody from the audience um, who raised a question on the group chat that I do want um, to pose to anybody who wants to answer. And I think it's related in terms of kind of the, the efforts we see of this administration to kind of control information. Um, there was an event that I was not at earlier at the Department of Justice um, where the Deputy Associate Attorney General was quoted as saying, and I'm just reading this here, an increase in nearly immediate litigation brought by some savvy frequent FOIA requesters uh, strains our FOIA officials and their valiant efforts to respond to every request in a timely way Litigation on the part of the well-funded pushes ordinary citizens to the end of the queue. Now that sounds like motherhood and apple pie. It sounds like um, everyone should have equal access to FOIA. But again, given I think all of our skepticism about um, how much we can trust this administration, um, you know, what do people think of that? Um, are, are we actually being told, and maybe Melissa especially can weigh in, um, not to litigate our FOIA requests, not to make FOIA requests. I mean, what is that message telling those of us in this community right now um, and, I'll, and, and the public? I mean, what are, what are, what's the message that, that's being sent there? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I can definitely start weighing in. And uh, in my role, I don't do any litigation. You know, our, uh, the Reporters Committee gives pro bono legal representation to journalists. And some of what we do is FOIA litigation. Um, and it's usually when they have gone beyond, I will say beyond, well beyond the statutory deadlines um, to respond, give any information, or we receive a GLOMAR request where they can't confirm or deny. Um, the, uh, again, while the, the, this is the principal deputy associate attorney general, um, I understand that, you know, there's people litigating in that could clog up the system. However, um, you know, we're not, we're trying to receive information. We're, we're not receiving the information about what our government is doing. And so if it, it's, it's not as if we file the FOIA request the next day where, you know, we're in litigation, you know, we're weighing all of our options. Um, and I'll defer to others on the panel who have been um, in some more significant litigation than I personally have. But, um, you know, we, we agree that there's, there's an access issue, but there's an access issue for everyone. Um, and so I'd defer to others on the well, panel. For sure. And I mean, I think Ryan probably has experience with this. I mean, I think one obvious thing, again, for those of us in our community um, that we can do looking forward is 
advocating for more re resources for FOIA offices and FOIA officers so that um, they can respond and they don't have this excuse of, you know, clogging up the pipelines. But Ryan, um, what are your thoughts on? Yeah, that? well, so I, I've worked with a lot of FOIA professionals within the government uh, uh, through ASAP and at, at government trainings where I've been invited to speak. And I think for most line FOIA officers, uh, they they also have a passion for FOIA and they like to to try to get information out. And I I mean I think sometimes they're 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 demonized and that's that's not good. It's always better to have a good working relationship. Um, but for every good low level FOIA professional, there is a policy fo a person or a political appointee above them um, who who's you know making life for that lower FOIA professional difficult. Um, I, I think backlogs and and then the the need to file a lawsuit to, to actually get your response to your FOIA request um, isn't new but this I, I think it is true that in this administration like we've seen it taken to a new level uh, I'm litigating a case right now uh, on uh, S section 232 uh, the automobile tariffs report um, uh, if you hadn't heard this, this report that was at issue was, was not published uh, as is required by law. Um, and Congress passed a rider in, in the appropriation, one of the appropriations bills this last uh, uh, end of the year, um, requiring publication. And the government refused to do that, um, published an OLC opinion saying why they didn't have to do it. Um, we now have a group, a bipartisan group of senators who have appeared as amici in our district uh, DDC case, arguing how crazy the administration is. And I mean, I've had open uh, in open court in, in a second hearing that was held in this case, uh, opposing counsel basically say that you are weapon, meaning me, uh, my organization, you are weaponizing the FOIA. Uh, the president has deigned to give you as much information as is necessary for you to know in a, a presidential proclamation last year. Um, and, you know, we, it, you just have to trust him that he's has the national security in mind. I kid you not, these were the actual arguments that were offered. And I, I think that you've seen similar arguments elsewhere. I mean, it seems like every other day in the Hill or Politico, we hear about a, a, D, a DDC judge who's throwing out declarations for an agency or grilling government counsel for for really making outlandish arguments uh, in, in, in under FOIA. And it's amazing that it's it's kind of come to that. So I do think that there's been a worsening in, in that respect. Um, and it's not fair to blame the requesting community um, for 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 the problems that that OIP and the and the rest of the agencies are are are, are suffering. I mean, too many of the higher up officials are not taking FOIA seriously. So we have a question um, from the audience. And also, if anybody just wants to ask a question, unmute yourself and, and you can ask these questions. You don't have to use the, the group chat, but I'm happy to moderate. Um, but would it be better if FOIA offices were moved within agency IG offices that might protect FOIA processes from political appointees? Does anybody want to weigh in on that or other ways to protect um, FOIA from being politicized? Liz? Yeah, um, I'll just start with two with two small points, and then I, I'd love to hear the my my co-panelist thoughts on this as well. But I think my first point is that there's it's not that there's no role at all for political appointees in the FOIA process. You know, FOIA is about government processes, and government is made up of career civil servants and political appointees. And so I don't know if we want to, I mean, that would, in my mind, it would be better to cut them out entirely if they can't behave responsibly and in the bounds of the law. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. And then, and then the second point is on inspectors general offices. Um, whoever asked that question, I love talking about IGs, so thank you. Um, but, uh, but I also don't know if inspectors general would want that responsibility because it would put them more, it would give them, I, I think it might create some tensions uh, or stress current tensions already between the IG offices and the agencies. And IGs are supposed to work with agencies, they work within agencies, but they also report to Congress. And so there is already a bit of a natural tension between IGs and an agency, um, kind of the main agency staff. And so I, before we get there, I would see that as a more extreme move. Um, and so before we get there, I'd like to try some interim steps. 
Yeah, if I could just jump and, and respond to, to both of those points, uh, I, I think they're both good points. Um, with respect to the first, uh, it, it, it seems to me we have to also think about the different types of political appointees that are involved in FOIA at agencies. So in, in the Office of General Counsel, the General Counsel is in many agencies going to be in a, pol a political appointee. And uh, there you, you can't, at, well, and the agency head is a political appointee and may properly or improperly perhaps be involved in FOIA. It's when you have, I think in my experience, what I've seen that's most problematic is comms people, pure policy folks who aren't in a sort of leadership position, or when you have the White House um, involved either through a White House liaison or the Office of White House Counsel um, consulting with agencies, that sort of political involvement is, is what's most problematic. On the IG front, I think you also have a problem of because many IGs are technically separate agencies, record sharing back and forth, it would be legally problematic to just move FOIA for an agency into the associated IG. Um, and plus, you have some agencies that don't that don't have an IG. One interesting idea that my colleagues and I have have spoken about um, uh, is perhaps moving administrative appeal processes out of agencies, um, either into a, a new agency or a special FOIA court, maybe, um, or somehow providing some independence to an appeals authority within an agency. Um, I mean, you have some agencies that are, <laughs> I'll never forget. I had a, I filed a FOIA request. I think it was with ACUS and the FOIA officer came back and said, denied. Um, and I said, well, I appeal. And she said, well, don't bother. I'm the appeals authority too. <laughs> so, you know, that's a slightly different problem than what I think the, the audience member asked, but you know, that's where we, I think, could make some movement instead of just moving FOIA altogether to the IG. Alex, you look like you want to come in. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I'm twitching because the, uh, the IG uh, being empty, right? I mean, that this is this is a problem. Um, Pogo, where uh, Liz, you know, works, has done a, a great job tracking the vacancies and oversight.gov now has that. Um, and you can see there are some um, agencies that haven't had them for over a thousand days, right? Uh, which is crazy. Um, the, the bigger problem that I think is not so much where they are located, but this question that was brought up in the frame of the state of open government, right? That there's a, been a chilling effect upon agencies disclosing information that would contradict the assertions of um, the political leadership, right? Um, and I think that's actually where the interference is most problematic, um, where there is a difference, again, between what officials are saying, whether it's the appointees or the White House, and what's actually happening within the agencies. And then FOIA has revealed that. I think it's perhaps more effective than it has been in my decade in D.C. in the last three years in showing what's actually happening and being discussed and what's being portrayed to be happening. Um, and like that, that is the, the kind of the state of things is that there's been a thumb put down um, whereby people are, I think, pretty clearly incented not to speak out and not to disclose things if it would contradict the official line. Um, you know, from my perspective, uh, instead of moving around FOIA, I would like to see the Department of Justice actually take its role differently instead of just being a, a compliance exercise and offering guidance. Um, they should actually enforce something that exists within the statute that they have never applied. Um, people don't realize that uh, in, I think in the 70s, 73, 74, FOIA was amended and includes a provision that allows the sanction of individual employees if they're fined, uh, if, if a court finds that their withholding was arbitrary or capricious, it gets referred, it gets investigated, there's a term determination. It's never been used in the history of the country. Now, it's very infrequent at the state and local level too that you see sanction for someone withholding records. But I think it's very clear right now that the incentive is to withhold. And despite there being a presumption of openness in the FOIA, which the people on this call fought for in 2016 to be in the statute, I don't think that the DOJ's stance here gives anyone in government any sense that if they withhold, they'll face sanction. Instead, the stance is that if you disclose something which shows the administration to have been, let's say, lying, for instance, um, then we'll crack down. Um, and that's not where we want to be uh, in the state of open government. 
but and but the problem I there is also it isn't just uh, OIP or DOJ and OSC, which is responsible for investigating the referrals. A big part of the problem too is the courts, because the courts are responsible in the first instance for you know saying that there needs to be a referral. And you know we're beginning to see some things change, and it's amazing what's happening now in district courts in terms of discovery and and. Uh, and cracking down and throwing out aff crummy affidavits and stuff. But I think for too long, uh, even though there's a standard of de novo review, you've had district courts that uh, defer exceedingly to the government uh, when there are really weak affidavits proffered. And they're, they, they give the government the benefit of the doubt and allow too many of these uh, shoddy declarations to go through and they don't really dig in where there's a possible instance of wrongdoing or, you know, intentional uh, improper withholding by the government. Can I, I want to jump in and say one thing um, about IG's access to, to government records. I'm sorry, going back to a few things, to something, Ryan, you said a little while ago. Um, IG's already have full access to the records of the agencies that they are responsible for conducting oversight over, and I and I think it's important to mention that because um, that is that was clear in the law already. But a few years ago, Congress had to re-clarify that when they said all records, they really meant all records because the Office of Legal Counsel at the Department of Justice, which we've already touched on a little bit, um, came out with a legal opinion saying that actually you don't have to share all records. With the inspector general and and it's really important that igs have access to every record that the agency has because of their role not just conducting internal oversight of the agency but they also serve as an external um co connector of information from the congress uh for the congress and so uh i did just want to correct that because uh it is really important and it is uh something that congress uh, had to really fight for thanks liz um, I, we have about 15, 20 minutes left. Does anybody um, in the audience have any questions? I have many more if no one does, but want to keep it uh, open. Doesn't look like anybody is unmuting or typing. Um, so um, I feel like the one theme, broad theme that's kind of gone through this conversation today is um, much of what we count on from our government when they're giving us information, whether we ask for it through FOIA, whether it's through, you know, press appearances or whatever, um, is trust. You know, we, there is an element of trust that we as the public and we as advocates and we as experts um, demand or need from our government. Um, and I think it's fair to say that that trust has been badly diminished uh, in the past three years. Um, so I have two questions. I have one, is there any bright spot that anyone can point to um, sort of in the past year or so, or you know, the past three years um, in terms of openness and that we can maybe feel a little hopeful and maybe trust some part of our government right now? And then the second, um, and I think more important really for me, is what do we do um, as advocates? Again, what do we ask for? What do we demand of our government to begin to restore that trust um, that has been so badly shaken? And I will open it up to all of you. But I know Alex wants to start, I can tell. <laughs> well, I think it might be useful to say that um, public trust in government was already at historic lows before this administration. And that was something that, um, you know, I referred to earlier, every time there's been a difference between what the public believe was happening, and what actually has happening, it's had an impact on trust. And that goes back um, to where there are historic highs of trust in the 20th century after World War II, right? And you can tick them off um, from Vietnam to Watergate, to the Iraq War, to the financial crisis. Um, like every single time you've seen public trust trend downwards afterwards. And it's not an accident that transparency laws have come in afterwards, right? And ethics reform that have continued to enforce disclosure, to enforce public meetings, to enforce ethics laws, right? And, I, and to continue to show us how our government is actually performing or not performing. I mean, for me, the bright spot of the last three years is that our press is still doing a good job, despite the environment, despite the financial pressures, despite low trust in the press itself, um, we are still seeing the public be informed about what the government is doing, despite considerable efforts to keep things secret which are obviously corrupt, right? Up to including the president taking abuse of power to, you know, for 
this kind of the subject of impeachment, et cetera. Um, the second is the openness of Congress itself. Um, there, you know, there's, there's something that um, we see, I think, as a country, um, when we see the votes, we see the hearings, um, we see the data that's coming out of there, like that is still a robust process. The courts can and should be more open, right? Um, maybe we can get to PACER and the problems of people having to pay um, for the raw materials of democracy, that's not okay. Um, but the, the fact is that we are still being informed. The problem is that we're being informed about our government's incompetence or banality or corruption or lies, which in turn doesn't really bring us back to feeling comfort and until officials uphold their responsibilities in full light um, and show, don't tell, you know, bring the evidence, I don't think that's going to change. Now, I, I have hopes that we'll see, um, you know, our government turn around because there's so much capacity at the federal level along with the state and local level that public faith in our doctors and our scientists and our first responders and to all the extraordinary civil servants, public servants, professionals around the country will bring us back from the brink, I think, of, of panic, which is where it feels like our tension is today. But unless we see that iterative building of trust to come back, it's going to get worse, not better. Who else? Melissa? Yeah, no, I'd, and I'd love to jump in on the on the pacer point too, because I know, um, you know, in the time that I've been in the reporters committee, we, you know, we're trying to expand in, in certain areas, right? So um, something that we recently launched was our local legal initiative, which was a process with us looking at different states and realizing there's a lot of news, um, again, at the state and local level that don't have the resources to litigate you know a FOIA request or they're having trouble getting access to local law enforcement records and so we are having a uh, an expansion into five different states um, and you know hopefully we can help kind of bridge that gap so that's you know for for us that's kind of a shining light you know right now I would say when we expand in certain areas like court access you know we've been working on a couple different things uh, recently, we've partnered with Fix the Court to bring live audio of the Second Circuit and Fourth Circuit uh, cases involving President Trump's tax returns. Um, and I checked before we came online, and the NBC News video has almost 250,000 views. You know, that's 250,000 people in this country that could not have traveled to New York to hear the Second Circuit. Um, you know, and we've tried in the past to also increase audio at the Supreme Court. Um, we led a media coalition last year to try and get the Supreme Court to live stream the Title VII LGBTQ employment discrimination cases, along with the DACA cases. Um, that request was unfortunately immediately declined, um, and there was audio at the end of the week. So on that front, and as we were talking about the impacts of coronavirus and the access to information, you know, Right now in Washington, you know, to get into a Supreme Court case, for example, you have to go, you have to wait in line, you get inside to maybe see the justices and see what's going on. You know, with Congress closing and us not being in the Senate right now and having to switch to virtual modes, you know, we've been monitoring a bill called the 21st Century Courts Act. And so um, that's HR uh, 6017. It's with Rep. Hank Johnson, Mike Quidley, and uh, Jerry Nadler. And it would increase broadcast access to the Supreme Court and to other federal appellate courts. Uh, right now, every federal appellate court has some form of either live streaming or same day audio that they get up, you know, right after that argument ends. Uh, the Supreme Court is drastically behind. Uh, this bill, as Alex also mentioned, would give people free access to PACER, which is the online court management system that you would be able to see a court's docket. You know, when we have reporters, you know, in the field reporting on different court complaints or an appellate court reached a decision, you know, sometimes if the information isn't directly linked in the story and you don't have a PACER login, people can't really see or understand the, the fullness of what's going on. And so this bill would, among other things, increase broadcast access to the Supreme Court and federal appellate courts. It would give free access to PACER. It would allow um, online access for judicial financial disclosures, which I know other groups have worked on as well, um, and force the court to be more transparent and open on whether they're going to recuse. I know in the, in the news, I think just this week, Justice Sotomayor 
recused herself due to a friendship with a potential um, petitioner or respondent. And, you know, we didn't really see a full explanation until people were asking. And so this would, you know, make it automatic. So I think in the future, I mean, we should be advocating for these bills that create more transparency and openness at all three branches um, of the federal government. I don't think you'll get any um, objection there. Uh, I think it's really interesting that, you know, especially, um, especially now, uh, many of us have been looking to the courts to kind of restore balance of power, checks and balances. Um, many of us see, you know, Congress kind of abdicating its responsibility in that front. And so we look to the courts um, to step in. And yet at the same time, as Melissa clearly points out, uh, you know, the courts are way behind uh, in, in a lot of transparency arenas and fields. So it's definitely something forward looking that I think that we should all kind of pay attention to. Um, who else wants to chime in on how we restore trust? Liz, your microphone's off. Is that, <laughs> that's your right time? Yeah, um, so I did want to just make another point about, about courts and transparency there. Uh, most employees of the federal judiciary also don't have whistleblower protections. And so kind of the internal workings of the judiciary are also not subject to the kind of oversight and scrutiny, scrutiny that I think they should be. Um, but, to, but to your earlier question of what are some of the bright spots um, during Sunshine Week, uh, I would just highlight two kind of general ones. I mean, um, to the, on the topic of FOIA, uh, we have I've seen FOIA work also during this administration and previous administrations, but I also want to, I wanted to highlight specifically the role that FOIA played in getting information out that was relevant to impeachment while the, while the executive branch was stonewalling Congress's access to information, they were actually responding with responsive documents to those subpoenas that, that Congress had, had served the executive branch with. They were actually releasing a lot of the documents that would be responsive to those to outside organizations that had FOIA for them. Um, American Oversight did a really great job of, of posting that information as soon as they got it and, and really pushing the executive branch to, to release it. And so we have seen some really exciting successes there. And then the second would also be that there that there still are whistleblowers coming forward, even while we have so much has happened over the last few years, and especially the last six months that would, I think, reasonably deter whistleblowers from coming forward. Um, but we're still seeing people do that and come forward and, and, and raise concerns about uh, not just coronavirus, but other but other issues um, going on within the federal government. And, and that to me is, is telling. Um, and so I wanted to also just flag that that up on our website, we have a lot of resources for any would be um, federal whistleblowers or even just federal employees or contractors who are worried about what are their rights and want to inform themselves. And, and we put a lot of those resources together uh, in, in consultation with uh, Government Accountability Project and, and PEER and some of our partner organizations in, in that advocacy work. Thanks. Thanks. Anybody else? Irvin? Yes, please. I, I completely agree with you, Liz. I think one of the biggest successes that we've actually seen in the past few years is how many whistleblowers are willing to speak truth to power even when it is very, very, very difficult. It's funny that the theme that has been permeating through that, throughout this discussion that Lisa, you identified is trust. And that's because I think we're at almost an all time low of the amount of trust that the average citizen can have in their federal government right now. Back when I was in school, I wrote my thesis on breakdowns in the US accountability sphere. So where IGs and the Office of Special Counsel and the Mayor Systems Protection Board, what happens when those things falter? And one of the words I used more frequently than any others in a word cloud on that thesis was the word trust. And the IG system, the OSC, the Mayor Systems Protection Board, this accountability sphere was created because of a fundamental lack of trust in the 70s between the people and the executive branch. It took a while for people to actually be able to trust the IG system, the Office of Special Counsel, and the MSPB. And in a lot of ways, those systems can still fail, and they can still be inadequate. But I'm hoping that what we can do to recover from this lack of trust that we feel right now is by strengthening those systems as vigorously as we did in 1978, 1979, 1980, uh, reforming the systems as much as possible. Specifically for the Whistleblower Protection Act and the Civil Service Reform Act, four things that really need to happen are granting employees the right to a jury trial in federal court when they're retaliated against for making a protected whistleblowing disclosure. 
we should give whistleblowers the right to challenge retaliatory investigations. So when a whistleblower makes a protected disclosure and all of a sudden they're staring down the barrel of a time and attendance violation uh, or some other type of, of investigation by their own agency, uh, that's a very common retaliatory tactic. And as of now, there are very few tools whistleblowers can use to challenge that mode of retaliation. Another thing is extending temporary relief to whistleblowers whenever they prove a prima facie case of retaliation. Facts are essentially there. There should be some way for these whistleblowers to seek and enjoy temporary relief. Beyond that, we should be extending these whistleblowers' rights beyond protection from workplace retaliation. As we've seen in the past few months, retaliation is not limited to the four walls of one's office or one's agency building. It can extend into the public sphere. It can ex extend into the courts where we've seen whistleblowers from government contractors facing heavy, heavy million dollar slap suits. If we do all of these things, we can finally put a capstone on the Whistleblower Protection Act and the Civil Service Reform Act while still recognizing that we may need to further reform in the future. But right now, I'm really hoping that we're setting the stage for a new type of civil service reform breakthrough. The same that Jimmy Carter was able to usher in when he was president and that he actually campaigned on. I believe he was one of the very few presidents to actually mention the boring topic the most, but the fascinating topic to me, of civil service reform in his State of the Union address. I think that's what we really need, that kind of reform. Brian? Yeah, well, I think in terms of, of hopeful areas uh, where we're seeing good stuff happening, uh, at least uh, within the executive branch, uh, the Office of, of Management and Budget uh, recently announced uh, in court, uh, so I, I don't think they put anything in the Federal Register yet or made it otherwise publicly uh, known, uh, that they are going to be updating uh, the FOIA fee guidelines uh, that apply across the government these were promulgated in 1986 and they've never been updated. Um, so by April 30th, there's going to be a notice of proposed revisions and an opportunity for public comment um, on, on bringing those 30 plus year old guidelines um, into conformity with, with the law as it stands. So that, that, that's both with respect to the, the statute um, things like the definition of a news media requester, um, which is pretty important, or the fee limitations that the 2016 amendments uh, added to the FOIA, uh, but also some of the important uh, uh, circuit precedents. So the DC Circuit's decision in SAC, for example, on whether students are able to get preferential treatment under the FOIA for fees. Um, so uh, we've seen that as, uh, we see that as a, as a, a a hopeful uh, development, uh, a good sign, although one that should have happened a long time ago. Um, but we also see Congress interested in FOIA reform. There's been a pending bill in the Senate, uh, 2220, Open and Responsive Government Act, and that's a bipartisan uh, effort uh, spearheaded by Senators Leahy and Grassley. And their Congress uh, is really reacting to two things, uh, trying to undo, in effect, the Supreme Court's decision in uh, FMI v. Argus Leader from last summer. That was the Exemption 4 case that basically redefined uh, confidential uh, in a very broad way. And I, in the few cases at the district court level that we've seen come out since then, we've seen just how bad this new test was going to be and, and how uh, much of a, of a negative effect it's going to have on the ability of people to get information from the government. Um, so it, it would, the, the Senate bill would reverse that Supreme Court decision and bring back the substantial harm test route from national parks. And it would also codify the DC Circuit's decision in, in American Immigration uh, Lawyers Association, uh, which had to do with whether or not an agency can withhold information as non-responsive. Um, which was being used across the government for for a good while, uh, basically as as a, uh, a, a, a an, an exemption, um, if you will, uh, withholding information is non responsive. So those those both are, are positive developments. I think in terms of of getting anything better out of the administration or government generally, it's going to take strong efforts by us within the community um, to to expose instances where the government is falling short. I, mean, I think we've had a, a good discussion about a lot of that with respect to whistleblowers. Um, AFPF and Cause of Action Institute are releasing a report this week on um, 
uh, agency's uh, compliance with the Federal Records Act with respect to the retention of instant messaging. Um, and, and I think one of my colleagues, oh, he's just shared a link to the report. Uh, we, you know, we looked at, I think, roughly 40 agencies, and of those that responded, um, 13 of them admitted that they don't save these records, even though uh, they, under narrow guidance, they should be saved, and they should be available under the FOIA. Um, and it's pretty disheartening to see how many agencies are, are uh, intentionally either deleting the records or, or changing settings on their computers so that the records are never saved uh, in, in the first place. Uh, Unless we keep exposing that sort of willful uh, failure to abide by NARA guidance or the FRA and the FOIA um, and keep bringing it to our, our, our Congress uh, men and women and other political decision makers, I mean, we're not going to see uh, much movement, unfortunately. I'm a little pessimistic in that respect. But we have to keep doing our best to, to, to make sure attention is is, uh, you know, we, we put the spotlight on the wrongdoing um, and, and hope for the best. Thanks, Ryan. And I am uh, looking forward to reading that report too. That sounds really important and really timely. Um, and speaking of time, we are out of it, but I want to just uh, end this conversation by actually being really pleased that we did come up with some bright spots. Um, our congressional champions like Senators Leahy and Grassley, um, the press, whistleblowers, um, and uh, and I think you know we are uh, very you know very fortunate that parts of the government are still working. There are parts of the government we still can trust. Um, this is going to sound very Pollyanna of me, but you know my bright spot is certainly the advocates, um, everybody here on this panel, um, and so many others in the broader openness and accountability community. We haven't given up. We are keep fight. We keep fighting the good fight. We will continue to fight the good fight, um, and we'll get there eventually. Slow progress, but we will. We will keep fighting and we will keep winning. Um, this was a terrific panel, uh, especially given our. Um, our constraints that we're not live and in person on Capitol Hill. So thank you all very, very much. Uh, it seems like there's a few uh, comments coming into the group chat. So take a look and respond if there's any questions over there. Um, but otherwise, thank you all. Stay safe, wash your hands, and, um, and be well. Thanks a lot. Thank you.